Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is we have uh, next up is Michael Bank. He's a, a Debian GNU herd porter, and he's going to talk about the GNU herd uh, port and how it's going and what comes next for it. Michael Bank. Okay. Yeah. Thanks everybody for showing up. So I was a bit worried that nobody would be interested in the herd anymore but at least there are some people who want to see how bad it's going. Um, <laughs> so, sorry? Well, you're right before the Unity presentation. <laughs> okay. So, well, actually I wanted to run this on the herd, but I chickened out just in front of the audience because my notebooks has a high SVG. As you saw, I have to change the resolution and I didn't know how that worked, but I had X running, I had this presentation running, um, just in the wrong resolution. So basically, it still works uh, natively. It works pretty well in QEMU and in Zen, but uh, yeah, not, not today. So, uh, it's been a long time. That, that's a quote from like, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe. I mean, somebody might remember Jeroen Deckers. He, he made a big flame war on Debian Devel when Adam Heath uh, said that the top level herd directory should be uh, removed because it's not an SHS. And then there was a lot of big flame war. And uh, Marcus gave that advice. So I want to talk about a bit about the past, the present, and the future because some of you might not know. I mean, some, probably all of you are quite aware about that it hasn't been released yet and that kind of stuff, but not really what the, the real status is. So there was a pretty good summary on the H recently. I don't know whether you've seen it about how it, how it came to be. Um, so you can, you can read that up if, uh, if you didn't. I mean, we thought it was pretty accurate. I don't know, I mean, how they researched it because I didn't, we didn't hear anything from them, but it was pretty good. So, but in general, um, the herd was designed by Thomas Bushnell BSG, uh, who's I think still a Debian developer, but not not that involved anymore, and I don't think he's around. And, and with some input by others, including Richard. And well, there was a lot of uh, thought about what to do, what what kernel to base it on, and stuff like that, because as you might know, the herd. It's not a kernel, it's, it's a user space system, so it needs a microkernel to run on. And uh, it was, at that time, um, decided that it should run on Mach, which uh, Thomas apparently didn't like that much, but he craved in and then uh, did it. He implemented the core system along with Ronald McGrath, who is maybe not a Debian developer anymore, at least he's also not very active anymore, but He's uh, still a glibc maintainer, and he's the original glibc author. Um, yeah, Richard didn't really code on the herd, as far as I know, so he just gave some input every now and then. In general, the architecture, as I said, it's GNU-Mach microkernel, which includes the virtual memory, memory management and the device drivers, and also the network layer, which is, uh, yeah, both the device drivers and the network are, is Linux code actually, so it hasn't been written directly for the herd. And at this point, it's still uh, it's 2.0 Linux device drivers. So we are really happy that it works in Zen and QEMU because they em emulate such old hardware that it easily works with Linux 2.0, but it's quite difficult with, with newer stuff, so I'm, I'm happy that it works on my ThinkPad. Um, on top of it, there's the POSIX layer. So actually, glibc for the herd is much bigger than, than for Linux because you have just uh, the Mach micro kernel, which does all this uh, Mach messages. And on top of that, you have the herd servers. And then on top of that, all the POSIX stuff is implemented in terms of herd and Mach messages. So it's, it's quite a bit bigger. And uh, so all, the, all what you know as a system call, basically, which is implemented in, in the kernel in Linux, is implemented in glibc on the herd. And on top of that, as I say, there, there are several herd servers who provide authentication, networking, file systems in a herdish way. And uh, you have the, f well, famous or infamous herd translators, which are a bit like Fuse file systems. 
but uh, you can basically do anything with them. They're just like docking uh, things in the, in the file system. You don't just, or you cannot just do file system, file system operations on them as you can with Fuse, I believe. You can basically do uh, any kinds of stuff you want with them, which is provided by the herd libraries, like uh, the disk FS library or the store IO library and stuff like that, which as they're all um, implemented in user space makes it in principle quite nice to develop against if people are interested. So Thomas and Roland are still around. They, I mean, if somebody posts an interesting question on the main mailing list, sometimes it just takes 20 minutes for Roland to comment on it. And he always has good uh, advice. Um, and he commits the herd-specific glibc stuff that um, our porters or uh, developers are sending, sending to libc-alpha. So as I said, yeah, he's still around, but sometimes he just has some uh, yeah, make it up again. But, but he's a great guy. Yeah. Then there was the second and third generations. Well, the second generation, like, I don't know, maybe in the, in the mid-90s, that was way before my time. There was Miles Spader and Mark Katniss. They joined in as GNU people. There were a couple of other people. I started developing more user-friendly stuff, like uh, host mux, or I don't know how it's actually called, or FTPFS, which already in the mid-90s was like a Fuse file system like SSHFS you see today. So you, with host marks and, and stuff, you could just write cd slash fdp.gnu.org slash, and then it would immediately go on the network, and you could just use FTP transparently um, 15 years ago. But, well, Linux has all that these days as well. But just, just to mention that, they, they, I think it was them who basically did that. They're no longer around. I mean, I see Miles every once in a while in hash Debian, but they, they are not around in the community anymore. And then in the late 90s, I would say Marcus Brinkman and Neil Wallfield. I think they also both stepped down as Debian developers not so long ago. They joined, I mean, Marcus started the Debian port, did a lot of effort in that. Um, he designed the, the Hurt console. Um, back then, there was only the Mach console, which is pretty um, weird. But the Hurt console is quite nice. You can detach it. It has Unicode and all kinds of stuff. Neil contributed important fixes. Some of them haven't been applied yet, but uh, mostly he, he contributed a POSIX threading library, which boosted um, porting of applications quite a bit, because before we only had a, a Mach threading library, which you couldn't really use from user space. It wasn't used, so everything which had relied on, on pthread was not going, and due to that, we, we were able to port lots of stuff. That was maybe 10 years ago. In, in the, like, I don't know, 2002, 2003, they decided, they wrote a paper, an academic paper on problems with Mach and decided to start a new, well, first they decided to port Herd on L4, and then it was called Herd NG for next generation because there were problems with L4. So to give a sneak preview, actually, Herd NG has been discontinued. Um, we're still using GNU Mach. We are not terribly happy about that, but it turned out that L4 had, well, they believed that it had issues for security stuff, so sending messages wasn't as secure as they wanted it to be. Then they uh, thought about going for another um, microkernel that um, Professor Shapiro implemented, but that didn't work out either. And Neil, um, he's still in academia. He's working on a microkernel design for marine management. Starting to fade out. Oh. I think this works. Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Right. So they basically removed, well, they, they basically um, stopped doing, doing that at that point. I mean, as I said, Neil is still, still there, but he's sort of moved like into to research, uh, operating system research, and at this point, w well, we or the herd community does not um, believe that in, in the next couple of years we will move to another microkernel. It's just not there. So, yeah, by 2005, they were working on herd ng 
And uh, while Roland and Thomas had basically disappeared in, from general development, they were still um, doing development until the early 2000s. But it was, it was pretty bad, Debian can hurt. We didn't have a build daemon running. I remember I was going over my old slides from a five year ago talk at FOSDEM, and the status there was, was pretty bad. Um, uh, yeah, we had frequent crashes. It, it wasn't so perfect, and even then, um, Marcus said, when I joined the herd in 1997, there was little doubt about the herd state at that time. It was just about at the end of a dying a slow death, which is probably still the case today, or at least at 2005. But then on, um, those three guys showed up, and they did a lot of work. I mean, it's going really slow because the community is quite small, but um, Samuel Thibault basically rescued the Debian port and the GNU herd on, its, on his own. So that's just one of the few stuff he did. Um, M68K porters know that implementing GLS uh, is important. He did it. I mean, otherwise, GLPC is really difficult to, to have nowadays. And he ported GNUMACH to Zen. He, he was doing a postdoc at Sensors at that time, I think. And I think he also implemented um, PAA, physical address emulation, or what's it called? Extension, Extension thanks. So th that basically meant that we were able to run GNUMACH on regular IA32 hardware, which could be as fast as we want, because basically before then, Mach wouldn't boot on AMD64 any uh, stuff. I mean, the Centrino is about the last thing that, that works, but everything else was just not booting anymore. We had lots of trouble with the interrupts, and, and it was, the hardware was getting just too new, and Mach was getting outdated. So it was really bad. We had to, we were running, I was running a build daemon at that time, and it had to be, uh, I don't know, Athlon 800 or something like that. Anything else wouldn't, wouldn't really work anymore. So having it on, on Zen really was uh, great. I mean, we could run it again. And of course, it was also great insofar as it was easily monitorable. You could just reboot it remotely, no problems. You don't need serial console or anything like that. You can um, basically, you can also, well, debug it much better. And yeah, I mean, he fixed countless of new Mach crashes, literally. I mean, I would. I would see on the build team that it's crashing, and I just give the instruction pointer to Samuel, and usually like 10 to 15 minutes later he would commit the, the fix to CVS. It's, it's just amazing. So he he fixed most of the GNUMACH crashes, so it's much better these days. He fixed imported glibc. Whenever Mr. Drapper uh, implemented something new uh, and didn't care about porting or portability portability that much, uh, Samuel would check in and, and, and do it. He also fixed and ported XORG several times, so X still works, at least with the VESA driver. I mean, at this point, we don't have kernel mode setting, so there's some more work to be done if we want to stay on top of it, but at least the VESA driver is still, I believe, still works. I just tried it. And, uh, oh, that's a typo. Yeah, he initiated basically the Debian installer port in so far as he made, like, made some research on it and then got it to some limbo state for a while where you could work on from. And also he maintains the auto builder. So I was doing it for a while, but now he's basically the main guy. I mean, I'm backing up. He's right now he's on vacation, so I'm backing up for him. But he maintains the auto builders. He keeps them running. We have um, a couple of them now. And uh, yeah, he's doing tremendous job. He's like the one guy who, why Debian Hurt still exists. So you have to kill him if you want to kill the port. <laughs> Olaf Budenhagen. Uh, he did a lot of community work. Uh, basically, he organized all this Google Sum of Code stuff for the GNU site. So we had, I don't, I, I, didn't really, I don't really remember, but we had about 10 projects now overall over the last couple of years. And one year, he even managed to, be, to get the herd being its proper organization. The other years, we had one or two, usually one slot from the GNU project. So he organized all that. He put a lot of effort in there. He, he kept hitting people to do stuff. And he also... Um, always is engaged in discussions about what you could do, what you could really do with the herd. Because at this point, um, we're just porting um, POSIX applications. But in reality, there is a lot of features which are still not really explored on the herd. All this user, um, user level, user space stuff you could do basically could be tremendously useful, but somebody needs to go out and have the ideas, and he's basically at least pushing the concepts. And 
Um, I believe he's also been working on a kernel, kernel graphics interface driver for Mach on his master thesis, but that's not integrated yet. And thirdly, Thomas Schwinge, um, he pushed things on the GNU side. So it was always very, very difficult because the herd and Mach repositories would still run on CVS, on, on Savannah, I believe, and only Roland had really had access, well, Neil and Marcus too, but they basically had disappeared, so it was very difficult to get fixes in because Roland wasn't there all the time, and then Thomas was basically not around, I mean, Thomas Bushnell was not around at all at that time, so it was very tedious to get fixes in. And um, Thomas Schwinger basically managed to get everybody going. He, I think he lobbied also with, with Richard that there were no new, new committers now available, so he got commit access, he got um, commit access for Samuel, so now it's getting much better. I mean, things are getting um, committed much, much better, much faster. And he also did this cross-building stuff so people could more easily cross-build uh, GNU her toolchain. And in the end, like a couple of months ago, he also migrated the repositories to Git. So we're, we're at, on Git now as well, finally. So yeah, they, they basically became herd hackers and now I want to talk a bit about the presence. Well, that was a bit the presence, but, but the status. So the community on one side, um, it's very small. Yeah? So <laughs> I don't know how many kernel, uh, Linux kernel hackers there are. There's about a dozen herd hackers right now. It's still a nice community. I mean, that was the main point why I sticked around, because just the community was so nice. And people like Neil and Jeff Bailey also, who did quite some work for a while, and Marcus Brinkman, they're just lovely people. And it was just great to hang out with them. Unfortunately, they're not that involved anymore. But still, the community is nice. People are great. And also, we managed that former Google Sum of Code students are still partly active. I mean, a couple have disappeared, but um, quite some are still active. So one of them even is uh, this year. He's a mentor. And uh, some of them doing new stuff. And lately, there's also two new porters, Emilio Pozzuelo Montfort. I hope I pronounced it accurately at least a bit. Uh, he's been porting a lot of GNOME packages. Unfortunately, he's not here. Um, I mean, you probably know him from, they're both Debian developers, right? Pino Toscano and, and him. Um, he's been doing a lot of GNOME work. And he's been doing, um, and, and this year he's, he's working for the GNU project on Google Thumb, some of code for fixing, well, I'm talking about that in a bit, but um, basically those two, they have been porting a lot of GNOME packages, KDE packages, um, Pino. So it looks quite good. I mean, most of GNOME and, and KDE has been, has been ported. So the community is great. And yeah, I want to talk a bit about Google Sum of Code because this year I think it's really, they're doing quite some, some great work. So as I said, Emilio, he's working for the GNU project and he's fixing test suite failures. So that's maybe some, doesn't sound so uh, interesting, but so, if, so far he has been fixing the glib um, test suite. And basically what we did, we were just well, disabling the test suite so we get the packages in the archive. And we never really managed to have a, uh, have a really deep look at them. But he's been doing it and, and he found lots of bugs. He implemented new stuff. Uh, like he found out where our implementation is not really POSIX or at least is, well, if, if, it's, if what Linux or glib is doing is beyond POSIX, then he was fixing it up for them. So it works and he had to, had to fix and, and port GNU Mach and Hurt and glibc quite a bit for that. He's now doing uh, core utils and I hope he's moving on to Python and Perl as well. Still hoping he does, uh, we can get him to fix all the um, database test suits because they, they failed due to uh, missing um, POSIX record locking. There's a patch which is 10 years old, but it needs, it needs fixing. That would be great. So we can only lock the whole file at this point. We, we can't lock regions of files, so all the database, database <laughs> test suits are failing. Karim Ala Ahmed is improving the virtual memory management, which is also great because nobody has really looked at our uh, GNU Mach, which is the fork that we are using for the last 20 years, I would say, or maybe 15 years uh, at, at that level. So he's, he's working on that. He's been doing some stuff. I mean, I talked to Samuel a while ago, and he was really um, euphoric about it, that, that it's, it's improving quite a lot on the, on the build demons. Cheng Da, he's actually a student from last year, so this is a bit misleading. He's, he's, uh, he, he had an application, but he, in the end he was rejected, but he's still working on, on things with a mentor, so he was motivated enough to still do this project even though he didn't get accepted 
for Google of sum of code officially. And what he's doing, he's porting the DDE as a device driver environment. I think it's from the University of Dresden or something. Basically, it's, um, it's a glue layer, which is much better than the current glue layer that we're using. I'm not that much into the technical stuff, but the point is that we're, we can use um, current Linux 2.6 device drivers unmodified with that. And, and he's, he, we now got um, at least the, the network drivers for, for Intel working, so that, that is working. I haven't tried it on this one yet, but I heard it is working, so it seems to be great. So that's, that's one of the things that, that really always had a, had a problem, because there were no device drivers that were up to date. Nobody wanted to update the glue layer that we had in GNUMACH for, from 2.0 to 2.2 or 2.4 or 2.6 at the time that new Linux releases were done. And it was just a bit, of, a bit of a problem. But now with this DDE, it seems that we finally have a resolution for that so we can stop thinking about device drivers. And finally, Jeremy Koenig, who is around, he's porting Debian installer for, for Debian. That's, that's the Debian project. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that here. Actually, is Jeremy here? OK, well, he's around at DevConf, but maybe not in the room. So he did quite a lot of stuff. I mean, as I said, we, we had a project about uh, like five years ago, and it, the guy just disappeared, basically. So that was a failure. We were not very happy about that. But now, as I said, uh, Samuel did some, uh, some initial work on that. And um, Jeremy has been fix, uh, picking it up, and it works now, basically. So he added init RAM this support to GNUMACH, which has been merged yesterday by Samuel and uploaded. Yeah. What a microphone? Okay. Colin has a command. That was always the blocker when I was trying to do this uh, experimentally originally. I could see how to port all of the components. Getting the damn thing to boot was the hard bit. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how actually how they did it, but he, he implemented it. He had to fix some stuff for, for BusyBox, like for example, for some reason, something in Debian installer or so wants to make dear um, slash, and that just failed because nobody thought that ever somebody would ever do that on the herd, so he had to fix that by, I think, fixing the remote procedure calls and stuff. He ported partman, so you can basically partition things. He integrated user space partition stores in, in libparted. Um, that's quite nice, so you can just use the partitions in user space. You don't really have to think about offsets and, and stuff like that. Uh, he ported BusyBox, or he finished porting it. I think Samuel did quite some work on that, but I think he now has uh, most of that stuff upstream. And he fixed Grub Installer. That was also the, one of the big problems uh, all the time. I mean, uh, maybe to, to reiterate how important that is, right? So we had these uh, install CDs that Philip Charles has been doing, who recently resigned. He's been doing it for, for ages, and, and they were based on boot floppies, if somebody re remembers what that was. That was what Debian was using before Debian installer. So he was using boot floppies on Linux to boot it. And then he was uh, extracting a base tarball, basically. And yeah, didn't even, well, back then it would have probably been possible, but it, it also didn't have any grub uh, installation feature. So people had to um, set up that themselves. And actually, it's a bit more involved than I heard because you have to multi boot a couple of remote modules. So that was always a big problem. And, and for a long time, you couldn't really install grub from the herd. And that was always going to kill the project, basically. You could just um, do it on Linux and then uh, because you had to run Grub at some point. But now he also fixed that, so um, that's working. You can, you can check out the, the roadmap. And yeah, so um, I did an installation on this one. It, it worked everything. The, well, the one, the one problem is that um, it installs Grub 2. And that works perfectly in QEMO, so you can just boot it afterwards. It works. Everything. I mean, you don't have. There's no hacks involved or anything. It just works. Except on, on native hardware, uh, it just rebooted. But I mean, I now installed it. Um, I installed Grub One on it, and that that boots. Yeah. Could be. As a Grub Two developer, I'm interested in looking into that. Okay. Um, yeah. If you want to get in touch with me. Sure. Can do that. So. And, and the rest of the status is, um, yeah, Debian installer is working. There's the installation report from Samuel a while ago, um, which he filed. So, well, there's, there's a couple of things. For example, it just sets the QEMO static inter internet um, configuration. So you can use it, um, native, we can use it uh, transparently in QEMO. 
but if you want to do something else, you have to set up networking yourself and stuff like that. But basically, it works. You don't have to switch on the console and do some weird command or stuff like that. It just works. Um, we have three auto builders. Mm, I believe Bach, well, Samuel has been dealing with that most of the time. I believe Bach is usually building experimental. And um, one of them is continuous building the failed packages in hope that some of them might get have been fixed in the meanwhile, because as I said, um, Emilio and uh, Pino are quite working on, on porting stuff. So I believe the current number is 67%, which doesn't sound so great, but it's much better than a couple of years ago. And it's really difficult. Uh, it's, it's not like you just, I mean, quite a lot of stuff needs quite a lot of thinking and working and takes ages to get these things going. And well, it's, it's going upwards slowly and we're happy, but could have been, could have been faster. And, and the great thing is that with all the work that Samuel has been doing on, on Mach, we now have about, well, according to him, because he's been doing it, basically the uptime of the build daemon continuously building is one week, which is um, much, much better than what we had a couple of years ago when uh, I had to reboot this thing every couple of hours um, and then file system check all the time. I don't see, I don't see any file system corruption anymore. It's, it's really much, much better. We have this send DOM U working, as I said. Um, it's not working out of the box. I believe um, Samuel has been working on that over the weekend. It would be really cool if we could just put it into the um, Debian GNUMA package. But with a bit of fiddling, you, you can get that going. There's QEMU images available. And as I said, most of GNOME KDE has been boarded and built. And there's a portal box available if somebody's interested in checking out their packages. It's user DRL up wired, so you can just log in with your Debian SSL key and it works. We can, I mean, yeah, you have to probably ask us about the build dependencies and stuff, but there's a change route. Um, yeah. So the future get more packages, get Debian installer fully working. I mean, Jeremy, I hope, can do some more work, maybe get it working on the graphical installer as well. We'll see. Integrate Zen, that seems to be her working already, and explore herdish concept for Debian problems. I mean, that's a bit wishy-washy, but, well, I don't know. There's, uh, this whole user space stuff and, and, and translator stuff might, might be interesting for, for some things. We have to really think about it. So far, as I said, we're just playing catch-up, but there, there's, you could do quite some cool things. For example, we had some... Google some of code stuff where people were stacking translators and, and using network uh, translators to talk to each other and stuff like that. You can do quite cool stuff with that if you just think about it and, and have nice ideas. Well, what, what really the problem is right now and what also killed Philip uh, Charles with doing these snapshot releases is it's just unstable in Debian unstable. So he was always having much, much problems getting uh, everything in a state where he could freeze. So he was basically doing release management on, on Unstable and trying to get a, get a set of packages going and then build CD images. And that's why he burned out, basically, because it's just so difficult. So we hope to get at least some kind of testing at, uh, after the squeeze release, obviously, um, because right now we're, we're keeping up quite well. I mean, there's, it's not like there's like hundreds of packages not being built, sort of auto builders are not a problem. We will just remove out-of-date packages, finally. I mean, I'm trying to get that going. And then try to get some, some testing going. And probably we need to, or we will dispatch somebody to release team if they want um, to, to deal with that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it shouldn't be the release team's uh, issue. But if, if they are okay with it, we, we might think about it. And, well, I don't know what happens in the end. We will see. So that's, that's the end of my, my slide so far. I can try to show you how it's looking, if I'm getting this right. Well, that's not good. So yeah, that's, can you see that? That's the Debian installer booting natively on the herd. It's, it's a, uh, well, it's a, it's a CD image. And that's GNUMACH booting. I don't know whether you can see that. So that's work basically showcasing. So while it's running, is there any questions? Yes. Hey, I'm, uh, my name's Jamie. 
I'm fascinated by the project, and I actually have a boatload of questions, um, but I'll just start with one. Um, don't take this the wrong way. This is going to sound horrible, but what's the point? Yeah, the point and, is... But, but let, I will accept, because it's cool, because we need another free alternative to Linux, but what's the, what's the motivating factor for Actually, the developers? Is, is there a Linux talk? I mean, Yala has been doing quite a lot of work. Is he, is he presenting that? Ah, uh, I was faster than you. I got it. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I'm actually also working on a port to the uh, Minix microkernel uh, the operating system as well. And my motivation is basically uh, because it's there. <laughs> so, okay, Colin, please. So I'm not particularly a herd developer, except in that I occasionally fix something for it when I notice it, but um, but I can offer one useful reason why GNU herd ought to continue to exist, even though most of us are using GNU Linux, uh, and that is that there is considerable pressure on There is considerable pressure on GNU Linux to remain stable now that so many people are using it. And it's becoming quite difficult in many ways to do uh, serious research. You can't, uh, you can't I anytime you try to make an extensive change, uh, it, it breaks somebody's real world situation. Um, and uh, it, I think it is healthy for there to exist. I, I don't really think it matters what it is, but it is healthy for there to exist a system which has enough traction that people are working on it and keeping it going, but uh, that's sort of a minority interest so that it's so that it has the freedom to do um, more way out research and everything else. And I'd offer that as a reason for the project's existence. That's a quote from Linus Torvalds when he, when he announced Linux. It says, do you pine for the nice days of Minix 1.1 when men were men and wrote their own device drivers? Are you without a nice project and just dying to cut your teeth on an OS you can try to modify for your needs? Are you finding it frustrating when everything works on Minix? No more. All nighters to get a nifty program working? Then this post might be just for you. So yeah, that's, that's basically the point. Um, trying to check back on this. Right, there we are. And actually, the cool thing is the Herd console does UTF-8, so you can basically, I don't know, actually, does it, does it, can you do that on the console on Linux? We have to use a user space console emulator for it, but okay. So, Jeremy, does was that because of the microkernel architecture that makes it easier somehow to to do development work? Sorry, I yeah, I was asking. I, th I thought is your name Jeremy? No, I'm Colin. Oh, Colin, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I d like I say, I don't think it matters much exactly what it is. Um, I think that you know the GNU K3 KFreeBSD port serves a similar purpose in some ways. That is an experimental system in some regards, um, but I do think that it's healthy for the Debian project not to restrict itself simply to GNU Linux. Yeah, right. So one thing to always keep in mind is that I mean the user space part. This whole I mean I haven't really talked about that. All the porting issues. All the porting issues we, we have like there's no path max uh, macro defined on on the herd, but that's not actually the herd. I mean that's the GNU project, right? So it's it's the GNU system in that sense, and our Debian port. So you always have to think about well, does it make sense to continue working on GNU herd, or does it make sense to continue on Debian GNU herd? That's like two different questions. And um, yeah, I don't I don't have why I don't do I have I don't know anyway. Okay, going, well, so one thing is that, as I, as I tried to, to say, so in, in Linux these days, it's really hard to get big changes in. It's, it's difficult, and, and that's also why, I mean, we've been talking with the new guys, and they say it's just great. I mean, you can hack around in, in, in the kernel, and you immediately see any progress, right, because it hasn't been optimized in the last 20 years, so everything you do basically might get a 10 or 20% boost in, in system performance. I mean, I don't know whether you want that, but... It has some, some instant gratification to it. And well, while Mach is not that great uh, from, I mean, it's a, it's a microkernel, so it's not that, that easy to, to hack on. The herd itself is, is really nice code. I mean, it's, it's like the, 
it's the same thing like the GNU C library, and you can do it in, in user space. It makes um, debugging quite a bit, well, on one level easier. On the other hand, all this uh, inter-server communication also makes it quite a bit more difficult. But yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but I mean, for, for Debian, I believe it's, it's just, it makes it a bit more um, portable in one hand, because now we have really the manpower, or we have people who are knowledgeable enough to fix things in a way that they just don't define path max to 4096 or something, so it works. But usually what you have is they, what you, what you rather do, I mean, you have like a file name or something, and then uh, usually you would just uh, allocate a static buffer of path max so, to be sure. And, and if you do that all the time, it just like wastes memory. And we have people who can now um, recode that stuff and just allocating memory dynamically on the right, at the right size, because usually you know how long your buffer will be and stuff like that. So it, it might also that the code in, in Debian or in the upstream projects might benefit from that quite a bit. Sorry, yeah, it was, well. Okay. Oh, well, then you first, yeah. Well, what, uh, is, uh, is, is SMP working on herd, or is it not relevant to... No, the we, unfortunately, moment? that's not working. That, I mean, it's, it's, it's a math problem. So, I mean, herd in general is, is multi-threaded, multi-threaded, but um, SMP on the Mach is, is not working at this point. I mean, I think we had to, I, I'm not sure whether, it, I, I don't believe it ever worked really. I mean, there was one guy hacking on it for a while and he got an experimental thing going, which I believe went in the right direction, but he didn't really continue. So no, there's unfortunately no SMP. That's certainly one thing which is problematic. So where can we get that CD image? Um, it's a good question. So is this working? It's on, on Jeremy's website for the, for the time being. Probably just should go to that. Um, there it is. Is it? Yeah. No, that's that's Samuel's. This one. There it is. Mini mini dot ISO. Jk dot fr dot eu dot org Debian heard installer mini ISO. And then just runs in QEMU. Other questions? You had one. Yes. Yes, uh, one problem I've been having with the Minix port is running into like Linuxisms in software. Apart from the PathMax thing you mentioned, what other like major porting hurdles do you have when you're uh, bringing software? Um, it's it's signal stuff. Uh, that, that's because our signal. Okay, that's because our signal implementation is quite old. So uh, Roland said has been saying it for ten years, or well, until he was not actively working on it anymore. That he has to re rewrite the signal signaling stuff in glibc, but he never did. So um, that, that's one thing. Um, then there, there's, well, there's a couple of these, well, the main point of the GNU system is, of course, that there should be no limits, right? So that's the whole path max isn't, so, isn't um, defined, the whole max host length isn't defined, stuff like that. That's, I mean, that's, that's a double-edged sword. On, on the one hand, everybody likes the GNU utilities. There are much more, well, some people like the GNU utilities. There are, more featureful than, than the old uh, BSD ones or proprietary Unix ones, but on the other hand, due to Linux uh, going with a, a classical Unix kernel, it also means that, that other stuff in, in GNU is just a bit of a hassle on, on the herd. Because it, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a policy question of the GNU system to do that. It's not a herd problem in that sense. Um, other things, there, there's, a, there's a, a website called Porting Problems on the herd wiki, I believe. So there. Uh, let's see, open issues. Let's see. Quite some open issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, you can find it somewhere. Um, yeah, basically, signal stuff, then. Oh. Well. Lots of other stuff we have fixed so far. I mean, the most 
things. I, I had a, uh, I did a, actually I did an ana analysis on all the failed stuff on the build daemon a while ago, and quite a lot about this pathmax stuff. And then it's just like random. Well, of course there's a lot of, um, a lot of programs, but there I have to really say that the uh, K3BSD port was tremendously useful because a lot of uh, programs will just include Linux slash FS or some header for which is Linux specific. Because they think, well, it's Linux. I'm, I'm, I'm not caring about that. And so the, the Debian K free BSD port um, basically has the same issues. And they are now release ports, so things are getting actually fixed and, and catched up on that. So we're much better doing in that. And then there's a lot of like glibc not defining one part of a structure, but it's defining it. So for example, our networking stuff in glibc is more modeled on BSD because that was what the people knew at that point, and Linux wasn't, I mean, even when I started, Linux wasn't, wasn't that big and stuff like that, so yeah. Is there any further question? Or, yes. I have, I have a question. Um, what would you say are the major impediments left to having a usable system for a user? So for instance, like, Drivers, I, I would imagine, is a big thing. Network drivers, Wi-Fi, uh, storage devices. Yeah. What, um, if so I wanted to yes, use her on my laptop normally. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is a is a big problem. Um, we don't have, we don't have sound. There was one guy, uh, Rich, uh, Richard Brown. Uh, he managed to get sound working for a bit, but he never integrated it. So there is no sound in in Mach and Hurt. There is. Well, now we have the network drivers at least, so I'm, I'm not sure how easy it will be to get wireless drivers uh, ported. But um, there was one guy called Stefan Siegel who ported PCMCIA, so basically with a old PCMCIA wireless card, you you could have working wireless. But okay, that's 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 been a couple of years, so you can't use uh, wireless on that. And then there was a recent um, thread on Backherd about what you what you what's missing, and for most people, it's that I mean USB is not working. So it's, it's really not, I mean, I have to really have to say, it's not, at this point, I think it's much more a developer system in the sense that developers can use it, they can use it in QEMU or on the per boxes or Zen or even natively to hack on stuff, but there is only like one guy right now, I believe, or maybe a couple, but one guy who's really using it regularly, um, that's, that's Olaf Budenhagen, he's, uh, he has his home directory NFS mounted and he does most of his work on the herd, but if he wants to listen to music or kind of stuff or basically watch a YouTube video or something, then he has to, well, do all boot, and that's not so great. But yeah, there's quite a couple of things missing, so I don't recommend it running as a user system. It, it's really, really for hackers, I would say, at that point. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Is there five minutes? Okay, is there any last question? Otherwise, thanks again, everybody, for attending, and yeah, I hope at some point, uh, yeah, it will, it will get better. Or, or even better. I mean, I'm, I'm quite glad at, you know, at the current state. I mean, it's, been, it's much better in the last year or so, or yes, two years. It's getting very slowly because it's so few people, but it's getting, getting better and better, and it's not, I mean, at some point we were thinking that it would just starve because Linux is moving so fast and we can't keep up, but it seems to be that we can keep up and we're getting better, and, and also we're getting, it's, I hope, I mean, the main reason for me is that I hope that it's getting less trouble for Debian. So it's always like, oh, there's outdated herd binaries, or oh, this is not working on a herd, and, um, and I hope that, that that is getting also better. So it's, it's less work for, for Debian and other people. We don't really want to hassle other people in Debian with a herd port. Okay, well, thanks everybody.